really nice. Um, I, I am glad to be referred to as a friend of the Graduate Center. The Graduate Center has been a very, very good friend to me. Um, the MLA Commons, um, which Matt referred to, would not have come into existence. Um, whoops, that was not supposed to happen. Uh, without the Graduate Center's uh, quite generous support um, for the Commons in a Box and its, its commitment to open source um, software and its principles um, that, that really made that platform possible. So at any rate, I'm really happy to be here um, today and to get to talk uh, to you in what seems like it's been a really fantastic series so far, judging from Twitter. Um, I, have, I have thoroughly enjoyed um, hearing what's gone before. Um, as you've heard, I am currently serving as the Director of Scholarly Communication at the Modern Language Association, um, but a big chunk of what I'm here to talk to you about today is um, grows out of my experiences with Media Commons, um, which is a, a prior project, an all-electronic scholarly publishing network focused on the field of media studies. Um, which I began working on with some colleagues about seven years ago. It's really kind of astonishing to, to sort of note that landmark um, passage of time at this point. In any event, um, when we first got started, we sort of imagined that Media Commons um, would serve as a way to help the field of media studies, which, which at the time remained and, and nonetheless you know, still remains, to be being overwhelmingly book focused um, for a field that's actually looking at other forms of communication. Um, that we were really sort of looking to help media studies find its way out of the crisis in scholarly publishing that the impossible economics of university presses had created for so many scholars. Um, but time and again, in the course of launching Media Commons, we ran headlong into the problem of peer review, um, which seemed to constrain the possible directions that the network could take. Now, I will, of course, admit um, that peer review is extremely important in the life of scholarship. In fact, it may be the sine qua non of the academy, um, given that we use it in almost every aspect of the ways that we work. Um, but I've spent a lot of time arguing um, over recent years that we need to start thinking about peer review differently if we're really genuinely going to move into the digital future. So this talk begins with two somewhat chunky epigraphs, um, the first of which stakes out a key, or each of which stakes out a key position on the purposes of peer review and scholarly communication. Um, the first is from Ray Spear, from his brief history of the peer review process, in which he says that in a world where knowledge is being made available at a rate of millions of pages per day, it is comforting to know that some subset of that knowledge or science has been critically examined so that were we to use it in our thinking for our work, we would be less likely to have wasted our time. The second um, is from Jean-Claude Guedon and Ray Siemens, writing about the credibility of electronic publishing, which they say that electronic publishing distinguishes between the phase where documents are placed at the disposal of the public, publishing proper, and the phase where distinctions are being attributed. It used to be that being printed was the distinction. Electronic publishing changes this and leads us to think of the distinction phase completely separately from the publishing phase. However, doing so changes the means by which distinction is imparted, and imparting distinction is a sure sign of power. In other words, those who now hold that privilege are afraid of losing it, gatekeepers, and they will use every possible argument to protect it without, if possible, ever mentioning it. So the key issue then in thinking about the future of peer review is in its role in authorizing academic work. Um, this issue bears enormous importance precisely because the nature of authority is dramatically shifting in the age of the digital network. Um, scholars in media studies, including Siva Vajanathan, Henry Jenkins, and Yochai Benkler, are intensely interested in these kinds of shifts as they affect media production, distribution, and consumption. Um, but thinking about these, these kinds of shifts with respect to our own work often causes scholars to dig in their heels. Um, this, I believe, is a grave danger um, to the digital future of scholarship because a blind resistance to the dominant ways of knowing of networked culture 
threatens the academy with a sort of cultural obsolescence. And the more we resist Wikipedia as a source of intellectual authority, for instance, the stronger it becomes. Now, similarly, clinging to an outdated system for the measurement and establishment of, of scholarly authority may produce an even more pronounced sense of our irrelevance in contemporary culture. So in what follows, um, I am not arguing that we need to find ways to better implement conventional peer review processes within digital publishing structures, or that peer-reviewed journals online are of equivalent value to peer-reviewed peer journals in print. In fact, I believe that such an equation is itself part of the problem that I'm addressing, as imposing these traditional methods of peer review on digital publishing might help the transition to digital publishing in the short term, but it'll hobble us in the long term. Instead, um, what I am arguing in this talk is that we must find ways to work with, to improve, and to adapt web native modes of authorization for scholarly use. And even more importantly, that we must find ways to convince ourselves, our colleagues, and our institutions of the value of these new systems. In order to get there, um, I want to take a somewhat abbreviated detour through the history of peer review. Now, the conventional wisdom has it that peer review as we know it today comes into existence in the mid-18th century, when the Royal Society of London institutes a committee on papers to oversee the review and selection of texts for publications in its journal, um, Philosophical Transactions. The independent outside review of manuscripts for publication following on the heels of this decision then quickly became the norm, or so the conventional wisdom has it. Um, in fact, however, peer review didn't really become universalized even in the hard sciences until the middle of the 20th century, um, suggesting that the history of peer review is, is far shorter than we may think. It's also in certain ways far longer. Uh, Mario Bijoli, in a fascinating article, argues that peer review begins with book publishing rather than journal publishing, um, suggesting that it stems from the royal license that was required for the legal sale of printed texts in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, this license, of course, was a means of enforcement of state censorship, as those who received it agreed not to publish any texts that were heretical or seditious. This censorship obligation was then delegated to the Royal Society upon its founding um, via the Royal Imprimatur. In order to receive continued royal support, the society was required to take responsibility for anything printed under its aegis. Now, what this suggests is that the peer in peer review originally referred to a peer of the realm. Right. And in the transfer of authority from the crown to the royal society, censorship transformed into self-censorship, as members of the royal society were to varying extents dependent upon the crown for their livelihoods. Now gradually, this mode of self-censorship became fully internalized, transforming into what Biagioli refers to as a disciplinary technology, which he means in, in a quite distinctly Foucauldian sense, um, functioning both to organize scholarly knowledge and to control scholarly behavior. Now along the way, of course, peer review sheds its connections to the state and to censorship, and it shifts from an imprimatur that was once about royal approval to instead one that is about technical accuracy. But the practice is nonetheless still focused on policing the boundaries of acceptable scholarly discourse. As a result, and because of the role that peer review plays in authorizing our academic lives, it's become so intractably and invisibly a part of everything that we do that it becomes difficult to imagine a future without it or to imagine any way that it could possibly change. So in order to examine what peer review could become, I think that we need to explore and to disambiguate um, the overlapping and yet non-identical purposes that we expect it to serve in scholarly life. First off, um, peer review serves as a means of feedback from readers to authors with the intent and very often actually the outcome um, of improving the work that's under review. And second, peer review provides a means of quality control or a means of sort of separating wheat from chaff such that only the best work is published. 
And third, peer review produces a form of scholarly validation or credentialing, certifying the work's authority that winds up being used as sort of de facto evidence in future evaluations such as the tenure review or the research assessment exercise in the UK. Now, in my book, Planned Obsolescence, I argue that these very different purposes for peer review are blurred in ways that are counterproductive, and that it would be a good thing for us to think through them carefully, to figure out how exactly our peer review processes are serving us well and how they're not. Um, for instance, those last two purposes of peer review, quality control and credentialing, are separate but conflated functions in our current system of pre-publication peer review, in which the review ostensibly determines whether something merits publication and merit apparently having been determined, the fact of peer review itself comes to serve as a stand-in for the work's authority. Now, a system like this may well have been necessary in the print era, in which the material scarcities that governed scholarly publishing created a need to ensure that only the best work was published, resulting in an assumption that the work that had been published was the best. Um, however, in the network era, the material scarcities of print have been replaced by a plenitude that, if anything, threatens to drown us. As a result, rather than focusing our efforts on importing traditional peer review into our new networked communication systems, which would sort of artificially recreate conditions of scarcity, um, we need instead to work on developing means of coping with abundance. In other words, what we need is filters rather than gatekeepers. We need peer review to tell us what work we should be paying attention to rather than what work should be published in the first place. Now, the need for this kind of filter arises from the web's very openness, which is precisely the source of its power as a communication platform. Um, the scholar's horror that anyone could publish anything online is matched by the network's delight in that same fact, right? Anyone could publish anything online. Um, new voices can find an audience, new formats and projects can emerge, new ideas can challenge established orthodoxies, all without anyone's permission. There is something potentially transformative at the heart of network culture's openness, which helps to explain why so many scholars today are making use of the web for both formal and informal communication with their peers. But all of this openness has, of course, produced a kind of overflow of content, right? The proliferation of online material that can make it difficult to find our way to the things that we should actually be reading. Part of our desire to impose traditional peer review on the web arises from our sense that things that have made their way through that process stand the best possible chance of being important to us, as Ray Spear notes in that first epigraph. Um, but this serve, raises a key question about the changing nature of distinction right, that, that Gaydon and Siemens refer to in the network age. I mean, when peer review serves as a gatekeeping process, it enables us to associate the conferral of distinction with the moment of publication, right? That a book or an article has been published means that someone in whom we have placed our trust, even though we may not know exactly who that someone is, has decided that it is worthy. In online communication, the locus of distinction changes fairly dramatically. I mean, the mere existence of an article online tells us little, if anything. Instead, distinction is conferred at the moment of reception, when someone we know tells us that the work deserves our attention. And this change is really crucial. Um, online distinction is created not by imprimatur or by the processes of production, but by the community that participates in the process through which a given text is disseminated and received. So if we were to focus our attention on developing a post-publication mode of peer review, one that allowed us to assess that community response in a critical fashion, we might actually learn something about the impact that scholarly work is having within its field. And when I use this word, I hope you'll hear it literally, um, impact, and dissociate it from the way in which it's too often gotten used in thinking about scholarly communication. Um, I, I really believe that, that those of us in the field of scholarly communication need to stop spending time and energy on the utterly useless measure of publication impact factor. 
and instead to think about the relationship between a scholar's work and its field, and about how we might, by making discussions about that work visible, by aggregating information about how that work is being used, and by turning that kind of information into a form of metadata that's attached to the work itself, actually begin to know something important about how scholarly work gets used. So again, I'm not interested in creating a new, equally empty form of impact factor by focusing in on a purely quantitative assessment of things like links and downloads. In fact, what I really hope is that scholars with skills that, attend, that um, extend to the gathering analysis and interpretation of complex forms of qualitative data, scholars working in fields like the digital humanities and internet research might be able to take the lead in developing new modes of assessment and evaluation of the ways that scholarly texts get discussed, get disseminated, and get used online, and the different forms of impact that those pieces of research produce. So what I'm interested in working toward is a mode of what I've been calling peer-to-peer -peer review, um, which is a kind of born digital review that takes advantage of the, of the metrics that we have available, as well as the web's capacity for discussion and exchange, in order to create a rich portrait of the lives of publications online. The question becomes how to design a system that is open, honest, and thorough, that draws the best from the wisdom of the crowds while up upholding the standards that review is meant to serve. Um, a system like this, however, also you know, one that, that begins to move the conferral of distinction from the point of publication to the point of reception, begins to require from us a profound change in our understanding of the notion of the peer. Right? Having already shifted in the 18th century from a status that was conferred by a monarchic authority to a status that was earned through scientific credentialing in a specific field or subfield, right, which was a, a narrow and usually vertical community organization in which junior members have to prove their worth to those who precede them, um, resulting in a tendency, as we all know, towards self-replication. Um, here instead, the notion of the peer comes in the age of the network to be understood as more horizontally organized, a status that's based in affinity, and most importantly, in participation in community processes. Now this is not to suggest that in the age of open networks, a peer is becoming just anyone. Um, but rather to indicate that the status of peer might not predate participation in review processes. Instead, a scholar might have the potential to become a peer through the quality of that participation. As Peter Frischhoff has noted, in this mode, peers can be selected on the basis of experience and trustworthiness, not credentials. Now, such a change in our understanding of the peer points to the need to rethink our peer review practices, particularly with respect to scholarship that originates or is published online. Whoops, sorry about that. Now, I do want to acknowledge that all of these shifts that I'm talking about um, raise an enormous number of questions about how such a new sh uh, system of peer-to-peer -peer review would be instantiated and how it would come to be seen as authoritative. Um, I've been looking at this question for the better part of the last seven years, and it just keeps opening up more questions for me. Um, year before last, in fact, a Media Commons and NYU Press received a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to conduct a study of open peer review practices as they were developing. And our goal when we proposed this study was to work toward a set of technical specifications that would allow us to develop a platform to support open review practices. Um, however, in the process of conducting the study, we found that the real challenges that we face in thinking about open peer review practices, particularly in the humanities, are ultimately less technological than, in nature than they are social, and that they open up as, as many questions and complications regarding the social landscape within which peer review operates as they do about the technical apparatus that supports it. Um, different communities of practice make extraordinarily different uses of peer review. Um, they have very different desires for its outcomes, and they bring very different values to its execution. And because of these critical differences, we believe that any peer-to-peer -peer review system would have to be designed and implemented at the level of the community where this new form of distinction is actually being conferred. Now, in the course of our study, 
Um, our exploration of the shifting notion of the peer led us to think more about the ways that opening review practices to new kinds of peers might further some crucial values and goals in humanities-based scholarship. I mean, we aspire in the humanities to engage our students, our colleagues, and a range of broader publics in exploring aspects of our complex histories and cultures. Perhaps the crucial change in our engagements with one another lies in introducing these new forms of openness. Um, but what, what do we mean when we talk about opening up peer review within networked spaces, and what do we hope it will accomplish? And as scholars, we already conduct much of our work in public to varying extents. I mean, we present work at conferences, we give talks like these, we discuss it in workshops, we share it with our colleagues, and so on. Um, typically, however, our publication review processes have all operated off stage. Um, but in an era in which increasing numbers of scholars are already sharing their work with the world via their blogs or via certain kinds of community networks that are developing, new open publishing practices are challenging the humanities to explore these possibilities um, that practices like these present for our fields. So many different understandings of the open can apply in the scholarly context. Um, must everything be fully open to everyone all the time? Or are there degrees of openness that might be useful to different communities of practice at different moments? Um, perhaps a frank discussion among a defined cluster of scholars would be particularly important at certain times, while a discussion open to broader publics would be crucial at others. I mean, perhaps we might imagine a review process that's open to volunteer participants while nonetheless still being conducted in private. Um, processes like these might require reviews to appear under their author's real names, for instance, or there might still be situations in which some degree of anonymity or pseudonymity remains useful. Moreover, these two different kinds of openness, right, openness of access to the review process and openness of reviewer identity, may be related, but they're not inseparable. So in thinking about the different valences of openness in this, this um, Mellon study that we did, we explored a range of existing experiments in the open review of humanities scholarship. Um, the Institute for the Future of the Book um, notably worked with Mackenzie Wark to post a draft of his book, Gamer Theory, um, online in commentable form. And while this experiment was not explicitly part of a peer review process, right, the manuscript had already been through peer review at Harvard and was on its way into publication, this process nonetheless raised substantive feedback for work that he wound up using in his revisions. And in, in, you know, not at all incidentally, a whole lot of this feedback came from the gaming community um, who would not have been sought out in a traditional peer review process. Um, the Institute then generalized the platform that they built for gamer theory into the thing that is now Comment Press, um, a WordPress plugin that allows a long text to be discussed paragraph by paragraph. Comment Press was used in its very early stages by Kathy Davidson and David Theo Goldberg in the process of reviewing and revising their MacArthur Report, The Future of Learning Institutions in the Digital Age, as well as by Noah Wardrop Fruin in seeking feedback on his manuscript for expressive processing. And both of these projects were greatly improved by the process, and comments from the open reviews influenced and were included in the revised final publications. Um, further experiments in open review like these have been conducted at Media Commons Press, including the review of my own planned obsolescence, as well as the two open review experiments we conducted in collaboration with Shakespeare Quarterly. Now, all of these texts were opened for review online at the stage at which they would ordinarily have been submitted for traditional peer review. And in fact, my book was sent out for traditional review in addition to being opened for community discussion, while the Shakespeare Quarterly Reviews took place as the central stage in a sort of multi-stage process involving editorial pre-selection and a final round of editorial board approval. Now, in all of these cases, the locally targeted, threaded commenting facilitated by Comment Press, along with the underlying social features of WordPress, resulted in some robust discussions that were aimed at helping the authors revise their work before final print publication. Uh, moreover, the Comment Press format allowed reviewers and authors not simply to respond to the text, but instead to respond to one another as well. Um, and the authors have reported on the helpfulness of having a social context within which to understand and interpret reviewer comments. 
Um, Jack Doherty and Kristen Narotsky uh, similarly used Comment Press to facilitate the open review of the essays contained in, I have written here their forthcoming volume, but I've just heard that it has actually just come out, um, Writing History in the Digital Age. And they, they said in their introduction that they used the platform to make the normally behind the scenes development of the book more transparent. If you look at the website for the book, you'll see that they really do sort of narrate the entire process of producing this volume in extremely interesting ways. Uh, Matt Gold likewise used Comment Press in the review process for the essays in the edited volume Debates in the Digital Humanities, um, as did Louisa Stein and Christina Buse for their book Sherlock and Transmedia Fandom. Now, in these two cases, the review process was structured around a community that was working together on a collection, with the essay drafts open to the authors who were included in those collections for comment. Um, Stein and Buse also invited two external non-anonymous readers to participate in that same process, and those readers engaged directly with the community of authors as they discussed and revised the volume's essays. Um, other publications have used other means of opening their review processes. Um, the journal Post Medieval conducted a crowd review using a standard blog format for their special issue entitled um, Becoming Media. Um, the journal Kairos uses an extensive multi-tiered editorial process, um, which includes several phases of open communication amongst the editorial board members and between editors and authors. Um, the site Digital Humanities Now uses Press Forward's combination of crowd and editorial filtering methods to highlight some of the best work that's being done in digital humanities around the open web. Um, these highlights are then reviewed for republication in the Journal of Digital Humanities. Now, these are just a few examples of many, many more that are, are developing out there. And I've limited myself in these examples to the humanities. Um, there, there are many publications in the science sciences and the social sciences that use similarly open or hybrid forms of peer review in their production. Regardless of their field, however, assessing the success of review processes such as these presents certain challenges, um, which may highlight, I think, some interesting but unspoken assumptions about the nature of traditional peer review. I mean, we assume that a traditional peer review process has been successful, right? That reviewers responded to the texts under consideration in a forthright, scrupulous, critical manner, and that authors made use of this criticism in revision when good work results from it, right? That's the sign that we have of an effective peer review process. Um, in an open review, we have that same marker available, right? Is the work that has come out of this process good? Um, but we also have the history of that process available for examination. Um, interestingly, that availability raises several questions that we've never been able to ask about a peer review process before. Um, how many comments would be enough in an open review process? And how many commenters are enough? Are the commenters established or prestigious enough? Is the critical discussion in which those commenters engage sufficiently rigorous? I mean, these kinds of questions get asked about open review all the time, but we've never had the opportunity to ask them about our conventional processes and have just assumed that they are working as we think they are. Um, in my own experiment, I, I posted the entire draft manuscript on Media Commons for review and comment press, and I requested comment from a selected group of readers in the field and announced the open review process as widely as I could, soliciting input via social networks like Twitter, Facebook, and my blog. Um, over the course of the nine months after the project was launched, 44 commenters, including me, um, left a total of 295 comments on various aspects of the project, producing in the end a, a much broader range of readings and responses than any traditional review process could have produced. Um, we are able, through those comments, to track the particular parts of the manuscript that are either of the most interest or that present the greatest problems for readers. Um, the page entitled Undead, for instance, had 26 comments, 10 of which were devoted to one paragraph alone. And because Comment Press allows for paragraph level commenting and for threaded conversations, we're able to get a fine grained sense of how commenters have responded to the manuscript and crucially how they've responded to one another's readings. Um, 
But I will acknowledge that, that the process was not perfect. Um, first, since the entire manuscript was posted at once, um, rather than being released over time, as has been done in several other open review experiments, um, it presented a really daunting task for readers. And several people who might otherwise have gotten involved in discussions as they evolved over time um, never quite got the opportunity to step forward, feeling too overwhelmed by the entirety of the thing. And second, perhaps because of that daunting task, um, the later segments of the book received far fewer comments than the earlier ones did, um, producing a real unevenness in feedback. Now, we don't yet know how to read the absence of comment in a process like this. Um, does it indicate a lack of interest, or just that nobody got to it, or that everything's OK, or that everything's so horrifyingly bad that everybody would be too embarrassed to, to mention it? Um, you know, just to linger on this point for a second, I mean, the, the internet is not a place where people frequently chime in to say, that's great, that's really, you know. So, you know, where a reviewer of a traditional sort would step forward and say, everything in chapter four is perfectly fine, you don't need to do anything there, but boy, chapter five needs some work. No one saying chapter four is okay um, creates some real problems. Um, Alongside this, I, I want to think some about how traditional peer reviews function, um, how we read and interpret the feedback and assessment they provide. Um, typically speaking, in a, a traditional review process, two to three reviewers agree to read a manuscript in a relatively fixed amount of time and report back. Any dialogue in that process is typically restricted to the author's response to the reviews, which is directed to the editor or the editorial board, depending on, on the organ for which this is being done. Um, on the other hand, in a traditional process, these reviewers are asked to address the entirety of a manuscript, right? as I just suggested, indicating both where there are problems and where there aren't. Um, and traditional reviews, for this reason, tend to lend themselves to a more holistic perspective on a manuscript overall, how its argument develops across the arc of the chapters, how well the overall structure functions, and things like this. Um, so on the one hand, this seems to represent a technical problem, right? How can we build a platform that will enable us both to get that kind of fine-grained paragraph-level commenting that I was able to get um, on planned obsolescence, but that nonetheless encourages large-scale overview discussions as well? Uh, but on the other hand, it's also very clearly a social problem, right? How do we encourage the kind of commitment to building a scholarly community that this sort of open review would require? And this, I want to argue, is the key problem, right? Not building the technological network for open peer review, but building the social network required to make a new form of peer review like this one work. Um, a number of projects are at work on the technical end of the platform, including the, the open annotation collaboration, um, which seeks to create technical standards and tools to enable the creation of web annotations that can be shared in, in multiple contexts, right? That winds up treating those annotations as themselves texts that have um, identities and lives online. Similarly, the Open Research and Contributor ID Project, or ORCID, um, is working to develop a standard for the unique identification of scholarly authors. Right? And, and these projects intersect um, with projects that are underway uh, among those who are seeking alternative means of accounting for the impact of scholarly research, um, including the Altmetrics group. Um, uh, impact story being a member of that group. Um, Hypothesis, which I have a, a little logo for here, is, is really an, an interesting project that's seeking to bring these various kinds of information together, right? Linking open web annotation with reputation management in a way that might lay the groundwork for an interesting new form of peer review. Now, though these projects are largely focused on the technical end of the problem, their interactions with a range of new shared reading platforms might permit the development of what I think will be the crucial element of any true peer-to-peer -peer review system, which is a means of reviewing the reviewers. Right? This aspect of peer-to-peer -peer review is, I think, key. I mean, just as the quality of an algorithm um, determines the quality of any computational filtering system, the quality of the reviewers will ultimately determine the quality of any human filtering system. 
Um, online peer review thus has to be open and public, not just as a means of creating accountability, but also as a means of creating reliable data through which communities of practice can establish and maintain the reliability of their own review systems. So in order to do so, um, they'll need a robust set of systems that permit them to make crucial decisions about their values and their policies, and to find the best tools to support the, creating the kinds of participatory review process they sink. seek. Sorry. Um, as a result, the final report of the open review study, um, which Media Commons and NYU Press conducted, um, leans heavily toward producing a list of issues that communities of practice should consider as they establish their processes, rather than specific recommendations that they should follow um, as, as they go forward. For instance, um, we suggest the communities of practice need to articulate for themselves, I mean, and this sounds perfectly obvious, but it's not anything anybody really stops to think about terribly much, what the desired goals and outcomes of their review process should be, right? How are works selected for evaluation? What is it that's being evaluated? Is it in process texts or finished texts? Is it short things, long things, um, born digital things? Um, and for what purpose are these things being evaluated? Is it for development? Is there an expected review stage that follows after this? And so this review process is aimed toward improving the text? Or is it for selection? We can only take half of this stuff, so we're gonna figure out what's working the best here. Um, and at what levels is this review taking place? Is it, is it focused on the sort of sentence slash paragraph level? Um, does it go up through questions of organization and structure? Are there larger questions of project design, methodology, and significance for the field being considered? Um, what means is this review being conducted through? Is it commenting? Is it rating? Is it liking? Um, many of these questions seem perfectly obvious, right? And yet it's only in the prior determination by a community of the standards that it wants to enforce that the community can assess whether the standards have been met. Um, similarly, though openness is a core value of peer-to-peer -peer review processes, it can take several different forms. Um, options include, as I was suggesting earlier, public access to and participation in the review process, removing the anonymity between authors and reviewers, and establishing a means of greater back and forth between authors and reviewers and, of course, amongst reviewers as well. And these different options require careful consideration within communities of practice about the value of open representation of author and reviewer identities, about the value of public participation, and about the revalu the value of reciprocity in the review process. Extending these kinds of consideration with respect to openness, communities must similarly decide what the ground rules for collegial engagement are, um, what their expectations for civility, reciprocity, and response might be. Um, concerns that have been raised about open review often suggest either that these processes will result in reviews that are insufficiently critical, right, because nobody's anonymous and nobody can say anything too mean, um, or that they will develop or devolve into the kinds of behavior that we see in online newspaper comments sections. Um, in fact, of course, neither of these things need be true, but creating an atmosphere that's conducive to collegial and yet serious engagement requires careful stewardship. Now, all of this leads to one of the largest problems cited in discussions of the traditional peer review process and one of the largest problems that we remain, um, uh, that remains yet unsolved for us. It's the labor problem. Um, first of all, there is an ever expanding quantity of this work of review that needs to be done. And second, this work is currently radically unevenly distributed, um, with good citizens being called on again and again by editors desperate to get viable reviews in a timely fashion. Now, in an open review process, the good news is that the work that gets done and the work that does not get done by reviewers is visible. Right? Even more, the work of review may also itself become the subject at, of review, right? as a community can evaluate the participation of its members, not just as authors, but also as reviewers. 
Um, communities, however, need to decide how this sort of review of the reviewers will take place, how its results will be communicated, and what stakes it will have in the life of the community. I mean, is this a community that makes the decision, for instance, that there's a sort of pay-to-play system involved in which you have to do a certain amount of the work of reviewing in order to be able to contribute your own work to the publication? Um, what is the relationship in that sense between primary authorship and review authorship? Is review authorship perhaps something that we in the academy need to value more than we have to this point? Um, there are, of course, a variety of technologies that can help communities of practice meet their goals for open review. And in the full report, we discuss some of them in some detail. Um, but we continue to believe that the most important systems with which these review practices engage are ultimately less technological than they are social. I mean, perhaps most important among these social engagements for communities of practice that are considering open review processes will be figuring out how to articulate their values to themselves um, and how their processes will support those values in order that they might then be further communicated and perhaps even defended to assessment bodies such as tenure committees and universities city administrations. Proponents of open review need to find ways to situate their arguments about openness in relation to broader questions about the purposes of scholarly discourse, its potential for public impact, and the importance of visibility for the 21st century academic. Now, I've only been able to scratch the surface of the possibilities for peer-to-peer -peer review in this talk, but I believe strongly that the most important conclusion is this. New open review processes have a key role to play in modeling a conversational collaborative discourse that not only harkens back to the humanities' long investment in critical dialogue as the essential core of intellectual labor, but that also models a forward-looking approach to scholarly production in a networked era. Peer-to-peer -peer review thus presents the possibility not only of getting traditional forms of scholarship into communication with broader audiences, but also of helping validate new kinds of scholarly output online. Making the process of assessment visible in a thoughtful and deliberate manner can only, I believe, help improve both the assessment and the work under evaluation. So thanks again for having me here. I would be happy to take questions, if there are any. Yeah. Uh, hi, so I work for Wikipedia, and you know, totally on, the, on your side. Uh, but the thing that really jumps out to me right now is worrying about ideological optimization. Uh, because if we stop having a canonical repository of uh, review of different works, we're going to into those community practices. We're going to have uh, opposed community practice, and we'll see a situation similar to journalism. Um, that's as far as I got. I was wondering what you thought about that. I, I think this is a very serious problem to point to, and I'm glad that you raised it. Um, one of the concerns about moving these sorts of communities of practice into online space is that Social networks online do tend to lend themselves to the creation of small, sort of, as you say, balkanized communities of the like-minded, right, who, who talk to one another um, and don't really kind of look beyond their own borders um, for other voices. There's good news and there's bad news in this. The good news is, um, well, maybe it's the bad news. I'm not sure which is which. Quite frankly, it's not that different a situation than already exists in scholarly communication, right? Um, journals are already extremely balkanized discourse mechanisms um, in which an editorial board or an editor um, has a really strong amount of control over what ends up in that journal. And for that reason, you know, scholars who think similarly end up publishing in similar venues. Um, here's the good news part. Online, that becomes visible, right? And communities are able to hold one another accountable um, for the practices that they put in place. Um, while it is easy for communities to sort of crystallize around particular ideological positions or particular theoretical or methodog methodological positions in online communities, it's also a lot easier for someone to enter that community and say, you know, you guys really need to think about this a little bit differently. Um, 
and it's visible when that community doesn't respond to challenges that get raised to it. Right now in the journal publishing system, those challenges are not visible except in the starting of another journal that's opposed to the one that's already being published. So I, I don't want to be too Pollyanna-ish about this. Um, there, there are enormous challenges with respect to um, creating non creating intellectual communities that are not all about consensus building, but that really lend themselves toward productive dissensus among their members. Um, but I believe that, I honestly believe that the best chance we have for that building that kind of dissensus model is really, is really in transparent open communities um, working together online right now. Hi, my name is James Richardson. Uh, one of the questions I had is I noticed that you've been working for a lot of the examples that you use utilize open source software. Uh, when you were coming up with this new model in terms of how to evaluate open peer, did you look at any of the open forums that you usually encounter in open source software development where this type of open peer review is commonly already in place? when uh, programmers and developers post snippets of code, mm -hmm. whether it works or not is easily identifiable by the community. And you will have other developers chiming in, hotly and heatedly debating the merits of people's code. Did you look at any of those types of communities of thought in developing the overall uh, model that you're discussing today? When we were in the process of developing Media Commons, we knew very clearly that we wanted to use open source tools because we knew um, that 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 kind of work was taking place. We knew that the community values were very much in line with the values that we had. Um, but we didn't recognize the at the time the ways that they functioned as being a model for exactly what it was that we were trying to do. And I'm sorry that we didn't recognize that sooner. Um, the, the technologies, I mean, platforms like GitHub, I think, are a really phenomenal resource um, for thinking about how scholarly work could get done. I mean, if, if, if journals behaved more like GitHub, in which every individual scholar rolled out their newest article and people could respond to it, if citations acted like forking um, somebody else's code, if we were able, through a platform like that, to be able to trace the lineage um, of particular arguments and to see um, the portfolio that someone builds, not just of their own code, but also their comments on someone else's code, I, I think it would do phenomenal things for us. So I've, I've heard a couple of, um, it's happened mostly in the sciences lately, which is not surprising, um, but I've heard a couple of folks working in, in scientific communication who are attempting to build a journal model on top of GitHub um, and to think about what, what that structure might look like and how it might function. Um, so I, I am sorry that we didn't take that into account sooner than we did, but I think you're exactly right, that there is, is a really robust community there to be learned from. Hi. Um, talking about this tracing the lineage of arguments, um, for the digital practice seminar, I'm, I'm a student in that, uh, I'm doing a final project that's a mock grant proposal for a startup uh, for NEH, and it's around citation practices. Um, and so uh, the issue is when scholars are using um, academic databases such as JSTOR or PerQuest, and they're using digital humanities type of methods, could even be proprietary engrams or anything. Uh, how do they discuss that um, uh, in terms of their findings, what methods they've used, and that type of thing? And it's been suggested that there is a lack of consistency, consistency and clarity. Mm -hmm. For example, what search terms did they actually use? What type of database is it? When was it accessed? Um, did they use it to formulate research questions or did they use it as part of their findings and so forth? And so I'm trying to come up with a, a set of questions that scholars might be able to address mm -hmm. and possible best practices. So the question I have is, one, do you think that might be, one, useful, and two, because the database publishers are not forthcoming with information about their databases, 
and because the results are bounded by the algorithms and other factors, mm -hmm. um, how could uh, publishers be encouraged to uh, put this information out and could scholarly societies uh, have a role in that? I, I hope that scholarly societies can have a role in that, um, just to start with the last question, um, because I, I, I think that there is um, some really important work to be done around, as you say, you know, tracing the lineage of an idea as it develops, um, a sort of genealogical mode of criticism that I think um, is, is there to be mined if we can make sure that the data is exposed and that we, that we have the right questions to ask about the data. Um, I just saw um, last week, as a matter of fact, I'm actually going to use the word, I participated in a webinar. Um, one of the, the presenters used as an example um, the work that had been done by the Optical Society of America, Society of Something Optics. They, they, they do optics in the sense of physics, not like eyeglasses, right? Um, and they have begun, or actually they've gotten pretty far along in this, the process of, um, of digitizing the entire history of all of the work that they have published you know, since the, the 18th century. And so they're, they're producing this massive database and they're producing it at this extraordinarily fine-grained level um, such that their citations are all marked up in a way that allow the citations themselves to be to be mined in a non-consumptive way, right? So that you can do a whole lot of tracking, not just of like how a particular article gets cited over time, um, but also what kinds of things get cited, why they get cited, what uses they get put to in their citations, and so forth. Um, the more that we can get our publications and our databases to expose that kind of data. Um, the better off I think we're going to be in terms of the sort of work that you're interested in and in really thinking about um, what a discourse network looks like in action, right? How articles actually move um, through a, a scientific or otherwise scholarly community. Um, right now, I mean, you know, I made this reference uh, to, to impact factor and the problem there, you know, as, as I'm sure most of you know, impact factor, right, assesses in a sort of ranked way, the significance of a journal, right? As though like, the journal in and of itself could have a particular significance separate from the stuff that's contained within it. Um, the altmetrics folks are really working against impact factor and are trying to figure out what the impact of any given article is. But a lot of what they're doing, and I love the altmetrics folks, don't get me wrong, but, um, still is right now looking at citations as a quantitative figure, right? How many times has something been cited? Rather than that qualitative measure of why has it been cited, right? What, if something has been cited 25 times in order to say that it was wrong, <laughs> does that have the same value as something that's been cited five times to say it's super genius, right? Um, so uh, thinking about how we in the digital humanities might bring the sorts of qualitative assessment that we're able to bring to bear on this work, that kind of, that level of analysis, um, to, to, to make those citation indexes something more than just your numbers um, would, I think, be, be really, really transformative. Steve. Uh, one of the hallmarks of digital humanities has been collaborative scholarship. And it, to complicate what is already a complicated issue of peer review, um, how much do you think that will affect sort of the, the move to sort of kinds of, 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 of things you've been talking about tonight? Um, and, and how do you see a way through that or around that, or is there a way to deal with that? I think there are some challenges. I mean, okay, moving from the sort of sole author model that the humanities has operated in for so long toward a more collaborative, collegial, um, potentially even co-authoring model. Um, is already presenting a whole lot of challenges um, for different kinds of review and assessment as they get practiced within the field. Um, some of which falls into the how do I know which part you wrote in order to evaluate your performance um, category of problem. But some of which um, 
have have to do with the ways that collaborative work is credited um, and not just credited in a you get credit for it when you come up for review sense but also you you get the appropriate citation um, at the point when a project gets cited um, here are, uh, here are a range of the different kinds of challenges that, that these models of collaboration raise. Digital humanities projects typically involve people working in a wide variety of different ways. Some people are writing words, other people are writing codes, uh, codes. some people are doing sort of physical design, some people are maintaining servers. Um, all of those are absolutely necessary to the success or failure of the project. Um, and yet they are frequently credited differently. Um, and thinking about what it is that we value in those kinds of projects um, and what is necessary to them, I think, requires thinking very differently about how we give credit for the work that gets done, gets done on projects. Not at all incidentally, the distinction um, or the, the division of labor in a lot of those projects um, has a sort of faculty versus staff. Um, orientation in a whole lot of academic institutions where faculty are doing the writing and the design and the intellectual labor where all that sort of code stuff happens on the staff side. Um, that creates some, some sorts of challenges again in terms of how we value the labor that goes into particular kinds of projects. It also creates problems in intellectual property um, arenas as faculty typically are protected by their employment contracts or their employment agreements um, that state that they keep their intellectual property where staff members almost always do not. Um, most, most staff work is treated as work for hire by the institution and therefore the institution owns the intellectual property over that portion of, of the project. Serious challenges to be raised there. Um, lots and lots of things that we're just going to need to think in, in a much more openly collegial way than, than we have before if we're genuinely going to be able to take advantage of the collaborative potential um, that digital humanities projects present. Um, I, again, you, you notice that I'm raising lots of questions and not giving you answers. Um, and like with the peer review process, I honestly believe um, that most of what we need to do is have really serious conversations that do not sort of foreclose an answer um, about these questions, but that instead allow more questions to open up um, and allow the conversation to continue. Um, so you've been looking at this for about seven years, you said, and I'm curious what the status update is, so to speak, of uh, of peer, peer review. On have you? Is this a transformation that's happening? That's inevitable. Is it something that we need to push for? If so, in whose hands is this? Um, I think these things are happening. They're they're happening with increasing frequency. I'm seeing more and more examples of experiments that are coming out. I, I mentioned. Um, Jack Doherty and, and Kristen Narotsky's project, um, Writing Digital History. Writing Digital History, I think is the name. Um, Jack and um, a colleague of ours, Jason Jones, at Trinity College have just um, concluded the open review phase of a project, web writing? A project on web writing um, that just went through like a six week phase and they got like 1,200 comments on this thing. And they got incredible amounts of in, in, in participation in it. And it, it is a really fantastic looking collection. So there's a way in which I think um, we're, we're, if we're not at a tipping point, we're nearing one, right? Because there are several projects like this that are really starting to get fantastic input and they're producing really, really remarkable outcomes. Here's the issue that this raises. It's all well and good for my project to get 295 comments, for Jack and Jason's to get 1,200 comments. Um, when everybody's project is out there in exactly the same way, how much energy for the review process are we going to be able to muster? Right? Um, and this is where I come back to this sense of a community needing to establish its, its norms for participation and, and to really say to itself, 
um, we're going to be evaluating you and your performance, not just on how smart you are in your own original work, but on, on your participation in this community at a very fundamental level. Now, I, I'm going to stand here and, you know, streaming to the web right now, tell you that I am a lousy community participant um, because I kept telling Jack over the course of that six week review process, God, I can't wait to get to the project. Got it. Went, looked at it, and said, I'm going to come back and read, and I never did. Right? So I, I, am, I am willing to acknowledge that I am a bad model. Um, for how community members ought to participate in these processes. But I think that, that it's, it's going to take some time, it's going to take some strategizing, and um, it's going to take some willingness to rethink where our time and attention are going um, in creating these communities of discourse, right? Whether, whether in fact participating in the discussion of somebody else's work might need to be more important to us at certain moments than producing our own. In order for that to happen, we're gonna need to be evaluated by our institutions on a less sort of quantity-based model um, and on a more community-oriented model. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Well, really quickly, do you, I noticed that Game Theory have really short blurbs, uh, or that you know each post or each page is really short. And I'm wondering, is there any sense that the actual form of academic writing is going to change in order to be like for the you know because you didn't respond to that because it was probably too much for you to look at the time you had. So, mm -hmm. is there a sense that we'll change our form in order to be more uh, conducive to this? I absolutely believe that that will happen. I think it's going to be a sort of slow and painful and heel dragging process. Um, but I think more and more, I mean, the more academics blog, the more they develop a voice that's conducive to that kind of public discourse. And so I think that the more we move into these spaces, um, in fact, the more we'll see work that's conducive to them. Yeah, you mentioned that the division of labor between faculty and staff sometimes developing these projects can sometimes be a little bit contentious or problematic. What do you see as the role, or how do you see faculty who kind of straddle that line between academic and staff in terms mm -hmm. of faculty who teach primarily how to code and teach the actual technology and not so much as the theory of how the technology is utilized. Mm -hmm. How do you see them progressing throughout the, the academy? I, I think those faculty have an enormous role to play in helping the entirety of the community understand what the labor of the creation of software is, right? That it isn't just um, a technical act of producing code, but it is in fact a profoundly intellectual act of, of designing interactions and, and of, of um, facilitating engagement and so forth. So I, I think that's extremely important. I think part of what I was trying to get at in that faculty staff divide is a more basic one about academic labor and what is valued and what is not. Um, and the ways that um, the ways that differential hiring practices and differential labor practices between faculty and staff often create um, contention. And um, sorry, my sentence is getting away from me. Um, cre create a tendency to see certain forms of labor as being more expendable. Simply support staff. Right, um, and and that's the thing that that I really want us to have some some hard conversations with ourselves about. I mean, who whose labor is it we value on campus? But in and terms of the tenure promotion, mm -hmm. groups, faculty who help to develop those types of programs, software, and so forth, their labor in developing that type of digital scholarship is not viewed at many times at the same measure or at the same level as the traditional printed manuscript. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so doesn't the academy risk losing those type of faculty members who yes. more often than not have the skills to go to the private industry? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and I mean, here's one of the, the, the glaring ironies of the state of things in the digital humanities today. Um, there have been a number over the last several years of really fantastic jobs 
um, for entering faculty in digital humanities who are being hired precisely because they're doing really super inventive new projects in which they're, they're writing code and they're creating um, interactive experiences online. And those faculty come in and they are immediately told, make sure you finish your book first. Right? And it, that kind of hiring, that kind of mentoring runs the risk of, as you say, running some people out of the profession. It also runs the risk of, of sort of squashing the inventiveness for which these folks have been hired in the first place. Right? Um, that that we've, we've, in many cases, in many institutions, these positions in digital humanities are imagined as being something that will help a department sort of move itself forward. And we end up by telling those faculty, no, you have to finish the book first. You have to do a kind of work that's recognizable to us as work. Um, we end up in, uh, uh, interfering with the very thing that we hope to create in our departments. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that these are um, crucial questions that a lot of institutions are just beginning to ask themselves as they start thinking about what digital scholarship is and how it should be evaluated in a tenure and promotion process. Okay, well, we are actually out of time. Um, I want to please join me in thanking Kathleen for a wonderful talk.